Welcome um, to this press conference on a cool and fresh and rainy Tanjin morning, the second day of the annual meeting of the New Champions 2018. Um, you don't see me as much. I'm, my name is Oliver Kahn. I don't do as many press conferences as I used to do, but I do my favourites. I do ask um, for special dispensation once in a while to come out of retirement to, uh, to, to help announce the, the, the news that I find personally most exciting. Um, I work for the World Economic Forum. I'm the head of media content here. For the past five years, it's been one of my greatest pleasures launching uh, what we call the Emerging Technologies of the Year list. Um, it's, a, it's been a, a wonderful collaboration over these years with uh, first the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Councils and now the Global Future Councils and the World Economic Forum's Expert Network I have two members of that network here um, to talk a little bit more about these technologies. First of all, I'm just going to go over a couple of my favourites just to get the party started. Well, who isn't going to be excited about plasmonic materials? You may not have heard of plasmonics, but they're already being used for battery, uh, battery developments and monitoring health, and they could well lead to invisibility cloaks in the not so distant future. Who knows? Lab grown meat. Well, we all know the uh, environmental um, damage and, and, and unsustainability of human appetites for meat and protein. What about if we get our protein from meat, which is, tastes just as good, um, looks like meat, um, has all the you know, characteristics, but is grown in a lab? Could that be a major answer to the sustainability drive our planet? needs to make. Who likes the idea of arguing with your, uh, your Alexa or your Siri when you wake up in the morning? It's not a matter of just being told uh, what time it is or what weather it is, but AI is moving so fast that the machine learning technologies behind these personal digital assistants is now going to mean that in the future they'll be able to offer you advice and, 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 and possibly even answer back. So, as I said before, delighted to have members of the expert network that put this um, list together. I'm going to invite each of them to talk a little bit about their special subjects and then we'll have some time to um, take questions from, from you and also from myself hopefully. Um, on my immediate left, joined again by Mariette Di Cristina, an old friend. Great to see you again, Mariette. Great to see you. Thank you. Mariette is Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American, um, been uh, with us, working on this list for five years, as has Andrew Maynard. Andrew, you're Professor of the School for the Future of Innovation in Society at Arizona State University. Welcome back again. Very nice to have you. Um, and we're about to be joined, and the camera will soon see our, our third panelist, um, Sangya Bli, who's a distinguished professor and dean at the Korea Institute of Advanced Science and Technology in the Republic of Korea. Marriott, let's start with you. What has been different or most exciting or noteworthy about this year's list after the, over the five that we've been doing it together? One of the things I love about our list every year is how they follow how human innovation is emerging itself. And so this year we're seeing AI constantly throughout the list. You mentioned a couple of uh, favorites of mine as well. Um, the idea of arguing with an Alexa or a Siri actually has some benefit. If you think about a physician who's trying to keep up with the latest advances in technology, imagine an assistant with, uh, powered by AI and machine learning who could review all of the literature, find where the patterns are that are too hard for humans to see, suggest possible diagnoses or treatment paths to the physician, and maybe even have a debate or a discussion with the physician to help that person make the diagnosis. So, I mean, I, I think uh, AI running through, through the thread everywhere this year is, is a really big one for me. Uh, AI seems to be a, a huge topic, and it's, and it's working its way through most of the technology. Um, sessions at this meeting as well. Is it, uh, is, it, is, it, is it everywhere? Are we going to be seeing AI for the years ahead? Another place we see, yes we are actually, we've been seeing it for, for a while now, but what's happening is it's becoming a lot more sophisticated as it continues to progress. Another entry in this year's top 10 list that I like a lot is advanced diagnostics for precision medicine, which are also powered by AI. And these, um, instead of finding one biomarker or a, a biological signal that there's a disease uh, happening, they find several at once, and there are many panels and arrays that do this. In fact, um, Sangyak will probably speak quite a bit more about it. Uh, wonderful. And, and, and we'll go to our panelists first. I just want to go through a couple of previous emerging technologies just to give you a taste of, of kind of how we like to feel we're fairly on trend and, and kind of ahead of the curve. In 2016, for example, we talked about blockchain 
and we talked about autonomous vehicles. Now, uh, alongside AI, there are you know, few sessions that aren't talking about the blockchain, not just at this meeting, but or, you know, at other, our other meetings and in conferences around the world. Whenever we put out a press release, I know this for a fact, blockchain is one of the most exciting and most interested areas. So huge areas of topics, and nobody was really talking about it in 2016. It was uh, in the emerging technologies list. So hopefully, that's a good sign that these technologies here are going to be um, fairly mainstream fairly soon. Within a three to five year time frame, I believe, um, we, 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 we guide. Um, Andrew, tell me about, a little bit about your contribution Goodness for, me. The, uh, for the list this year. So, so I always have a very tough spot here because my day job is trying to ask tough questions about what could go wrong with these technologies. But at the same time, I have my inner geek that gets really excited about them. So I, there are a couple, that, in fact, three that really stood out um, to me here. Uh, Mariette has just mentioned one of them, the, the cultured meat, the, the lab-grown meat, which I think is tremendously exciting. Um, a couple of others, though, one that really excites and intrigues me and one that does worry me. The, the first one is um, augmented reality. Um, so we've had this promise of augmented reality, the idea that we can overlay um, another set of digital information on what we see for a number of years now, but we're just on the cusp of this becoming reality, especially with breakthroughs such as 5G networks with phones, uh, with very powerful computing. Um, for anybody that's experienced augmented reality with high resolution headsets, it's utterly transformative, where you can be immersed in an environment where you can see 3G projections that look as if they're real. So I think this is going to be incredibly transformative. Um, the other one which has been bubbling along for some years now but really is gaining a lot of attention is gene drives. So this is the ability to actually modify a whole species genetically. So imagine you can take mosquitoes and you can genetically engineer mosquitoes, not so you get rid of them, but so that they no longer carry malaria. Or you can modify locusts so they don't swarm. It's incredibly powerful, this technology, being able to engineer things so that their, their traits are heritable. But as you can imagine, there are an awful lot of things that might possibly go wrong with this if we don't get it right. And that's why we love you uh, being on the panel, Andrew. So, uh, so I know, I'm, I'm the downer. You're, you're, <laughs> we, all need a, we all need a safety valve, and we'll come to that as, as well. One of the comments that I um, stood out for me yesterday at this meeting was a session on dual-use technology. The, the, you know, the fact that civilian uh, technology designed for civilian use can be re-engineered for, for military purposes. And, and one of the comments that, um, that really stood out and worried me a little bit was the comment from one of the panelists that the ship has sailed in terms of governance. So maybe we'll have a few questions around, around that. But, uh, but, but thank you very much for joining us, Sangyup. Um, I know there's been traffic issues in yes, Tianjin, and on behalf of the forum, I do apologize for, um, for, the, for the traffic and the, uh, the organization here, but we're very, very glad you could join us. Could you please tell us a little bit about your contribution? Yeah, well, actually, this year's top 10 list uh, tracks me a lot, but uh, let me uh, talk uh, about uh, maybe two or three uh, items now. One is uh, implantable drug-making cells. So as you know, if you have a, a diabetes, you have to prick your fingers, monitor the glucose concentration, and then you have to inject your insulin. What if you have this islet cell implanted in your body, which responds to the level of glucose, and then automatically treat your diabetes symptom? Well, that was not easy, even though a lot of scientists and doctors have tried, because when you capture these cells in a protective uh, material, so that they can release drugs at the right time, that causes uh, fibrosis. So it's not gonna work in your body. Recent years, and very recently, there have been attempts to make uh, new material based on old known material, which is known to be biocomparable, and then it allows uh, cells to release drugs without causing fibrosis problem. So this will make a, a significant contribution if and also if uh, it's uh, linked with the synthetic biology where you can engineer cells further so that very nice drugs can be actually uh, delivered uh, at the right spot at the right time when uh, patients need. Another technology uh, that drew my attention was electroceuticals. So as you know, electroceuticals by the name, it says, oh, it must uh, be doing something with your neurological disorders because you know, our neurons are all electric responsive. However, recent studies shown that actually neurological uh, transmitters or neurotransmitters 
can be released at a uh, desired location such as spleen, which will in turn trigger release of certain chemicals that prevents inflammation, for example. Mm -hmm. So that was first a good demonstration that actually electrical stimuli can deliver chemicals that can uh, suppress some bad symptoms. So I like that idea of uh, electrosurical. Maybe if I had one more thing, AI for materials. Mm -hmm. I love that yeah, because I, I use that <laughs> already. So artificial intelligence can be used to scan through all the known chemical reactions to design very complicated reaction steps much, much faster and efficiently than humans can do. I use it for scanning drug-drug interactions. There has been about 2,159 known drugs. So if you take two drugs, which you will most likely when you get older, and uh, there might be some unknown drug-drug uh, -drug interactions which can be damaging your body. Now using AI, you can actually scan through this 2159 times 2158 divided by two. So it's more than 230 million, uh, sorry, 2.3 million interactions, right? And then uh, we were able to identify potentially harmful uh, reactions that correspond to about more than 430,000. And these need to be uh, paid attention for pharmacists and also medical doctors when they are giving uh, drugs. And I think uh, AI for materials will even further advance to link all these things together. So essentially what we're looking at is through the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence, a huge acceleration of the speed of discovery. Absolutely. One question for me before I open it up to my friends in the, on the floor. A lot of these technologies have been around, electroceuticals have been around, the, um, the, the, the diagnostics, the personalized medicine has been around. What's happened in 2018 to make this, you know, make this you know, get these onto your list? I think, um, yes, you are, you are right in that uh, these you know, technologies have been around for their potentials, but I think this year it actually been demonstrated in, uh, in a small clinical setting as well. So I think that's why, you know, okay, now these technologies are one step closer to a real life. And that's why it's selected in this year's uh, list. For me also, they, they've taken a leap forward. So, you know, this Shakespeare said there is nothing that is new under the sun. Everything is part of a long continuum of change in human history. But in the case of, for instance, the, uh, the diagnostics, we've gone from detecting single features to detecting multiple with assays that can do it all at once. And that reduces the cost, that makes things faster. In the case of um, electroceuticals, we're seeing a transition from invasive stimulators of the vagus nerve to non-invasive. Mm -hmm. So again, making it uh, less expensive, easier to use, faster to use. What's, what's not to like about non-invasive? Sounds, sounds yeah, a positive absolutely. development. It does sound positive. And let's have Even it Andrew likes it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the acid <laughs> test. And let's have a quick show of hands. Who's got questions? Yep. Gentleman in the front. Can we get a microphone here, please? Can you remind us uh, of your name and where you're from, please, sir? Okay, my name is Neil uh, from the uh, uh, media. And actually, my question is, uh, you talk about a lot of advanced technologies. But I think in China, the, the health is a major issue. And the cancer, we think, is the top of the, the diseases that cause the, the many deaths. And so what I want to know is what the advance in the curing the cancer, and is there any mass, um, I think, uh, treatment to the public? Anything you can say about this? Thank you. A question on cancer. Let's just see if there's any other questions first. Anybody else? Okay. Um, Professor, yeah, maybe, maybe, I can, maybe I can start. So, advanced diagnostics for precision medicine can help from this year's list because, you know, cancer patients, even though they have the uh, been diagnosed with, for example, lung cancer or uh, gastric cancer, actually they are different from person to person. So we're not gonna be able to treat cancer individual specific because it's gonna be too much costly. However, we can at least group subpopulations who are most likely to be responsive in a similar manner and most likely to receive the, uh, this treatment and the work better. That's called precision medicine. Now, this year's list 
includes these advanced diagnostics, which can classify not only biomarkers, but also panomic scale data that can classify patients into certain subpopulations that can immensely help treat uh, cancer patients better than before. So that's one contribution I can say. It's a sobering thought when sometimes, in, I, think, I believe in the US now, the average age is actually declining for the first time. Um, so, yeah, we are working very, very hard to improve science. Yes. And at the same time, new challenges are, 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 are coming, are coming in um, and, and facing us, hitting us in the face. Um, okay, whilst we wait for other questions, uh, a curiosity from myself. I've been doing this list, as we all have, for, for a few years now, and I, I look forward to it every year. There's a lot of AI this year. We've established that. There's a lot of health-related technologies we've established this. But one, one, one area where I've, um, I've come, become accustomed to seeing technologies emerge is the kind of sustainability in the energy space. And, and my question is, why is that less of a focus this year? And, and given your ability to have a long range into the future, do you think that we're going to you know, uh, see a kind of plattering off of certain technologies and certain areas of advance? Uh, maybe research funding is going in um, unequal divisions across various areas. What, what's, your, what's your take on the situation? So I, I don't think it's an issue of um, funding pulling back. I think it's just that we plateau in some areas temporarily. So if you look at the discussions around this year's list, it wasn't that there was a lack of advances in areas related to sustainability. It's just that other things really caught our attention and sparkled. Um, but I would also say that if you think about big questions around sustainability, how do we use energy better? How do we use renewables? How do we stop polluting the, the Earth as much as we do? Many of the technologies here are directly applicable to that. Mm -hmm. So you've got to draw a line between the capability and what we can actually do with it. So for instance, AI designed materials, if you're looking at physical materials, this is where we have the ability to build much better batteries because we can discover materials that have never previously existed. So I think there is that strong connection there. It's just a little bit under the surface. And also, I mean, this is seventh edition of top 10 emerging technology already, which means that we have already disclosed the 60 different emerging technologies, <laughs> right. which cover a lot of, you know, those technologies. And uh, one, one of the uh, rules when we are selecting the list is that we're not going to list the same thing again. So uh, even though some of those emerging technologies appeared, say, three years ago, are still important and rapidly advancing, well, that has been already covered. So it's not going to be listed again. I'm not going to test you on the, uh, <laughs> the 60 past and present emerging technologies. Uh, but Mariad, you're, uh, you, you, Eddie, you're the editor-in-chief of the world's best-known science publication. Give us the benefit of your vision as to other exciting areas that maybe we could be looking forward to reading about in a year's time. One of the things I always look forward to seeing is new materials advances, especially. So um, it was very resonant with me, this idea of using AI for creating new materials that Sanyapas talked about, but, but also the plasmonics. So just like you were saying at the beginning of our chat that you know a few years, a couple of, last year we were talking about blockchain, it wasn't really out there, now it's everywhere. Plasmonics, I suspect, would be one of those technologies that we start to see very routinely under a lot of different areas. Uh, for instance, they're already used as sensors. You, you've mentioned the, the fun Harry Potter idea of, you know, because these um, manipulating the, the um, plasmons on the surface can deflect light, you can actually reduce the, the visibility of something and create a quote unquote invisibility cloak. But there are many other uh, ad advances that you can use that technology for, from, you know, from, from sensing to manipulating material in many ways. And there's a lot of money flowing in to do that. Just see if there's any more questions. If not, I've got one to, to, to close on, and it's, uh, it's one for Andrew. So let's go back to that governance issue. And, and, and do you agree with that um, comment that the, the ship has sailed when it comes to um, you know, convening the right leadership and the right energy and ingenuity to create an environment where we can govern the, any negative uses and, and, and side effects of these technologies? No, I, I don't. Um, and I don't because I think that that's partially just too depressing a thought, but also I think there is optimism here. If you look at these technologies, there is tremendous potential to improve people's lives. 
Um, and we can't afford to turn our back on that and say that the, the ship sailed. I think we've got an uphill struggle. So definitely the gap between what we can achieve with technologies and how we understand how to do that safely and beneficially is widening. And we've got to get smart at how we narrow this gap. And that's exactly actually what we're doing through the forum with ideas such as agile governance. How do we develop approaches to ensuring that the safety and the responsibility of technology is by closing that gap using innovative methods? So I don't think that the ship has uh, sailed. I think we have a huge uphill struggle in front of us. But I actually think that we have the innovative capabilities to close that gap. Thank you so much. And that is indeed what we'll be trying to do here at the annual meeting of the New Champions 2018. Thank you very much for joining us Thank this you, morning. And it's been Thank difficult you. getting in. I appreciate that. And it's wonderful to have this annual annual uh, engagement. And thank you so much for joining us here in the room and watching us live online. This session is now over.